Hi guys, uh, welcome to this wonderful lecture taught to you by Cal Stewart. Uh, Cal is one of our alumni from our summer intensive program. He graduated in 2014 and he is going to bring you guys a really awesome lecture on film photography. So his goal is to make it comfortable for you guys so that it becomes um, something interesting. That it's not too weird to get into or to get back into if you haven't been into it before. Um, so he's going to talk tonight. Uh, we have some people local in the audience and some people who are watching online. So uh, we should be able to wrap everything together for all of you. Um, but our lecture should go for about hour 15 minutes or so just to give you guys a heads up. And um, if you guys are watching online, be sure to comment with any questions you have and we can pipe up with that in the classroom here and Cal can answer those for you or we can answer them on the, on the screen. Um, and also if you guys enjoy this video on YouTube, feel free to give it a like and we will produce more like it. Um, so thank you for watching and uh, we hope you enjoy this wonderful lecture from Cal who loves film photography. <laughs> <laughs> you ready? Ready, thank you. Okay. So, good evening everyone and welcome to um, another evening lecture at the Rocky Mountain School of Photography. My name's Cal Stewart and this evening we're going to be talking about this. We're going to be talking about film. Um, there was probably a time about 15 years ago where we thought that film might not survive. Um, in the mid-2000s, around when digital took over as the dominant capture medium, the concern was that there just weren't enough people shooting film to make it worthwhile for the big companies to continue producing film. But if we fast forward to today, film is not only still available, but the numbers of people who are shooting film is actually increasing slightly. So all this begs the question of why shoot film? If digital is so prevalent and the results that we can get with it are outstanding, why would you shoot film? Well, these are some of the questions that we're going to look at this evening. Um, as Sarah mentioned, my name's Cal Stewart. If you can't tell from my accent, I'm Australian originally, although I've been living in the States on and off for the past five years. I'm a photographer that's based here in Missoula, Montana, and I shoot a mix of film and digital. So the first question that I want to look at ever so briefly is what is film? Film is basically plastic in chemistry. What I have right here in my hand is a used strip of black and white film that I developed at home. And from a physical f standpoint, film is really just a piece of plastic. It's actually a particular type of plastic called acetate, which is pretty commonplace and by itself is not really that interesting or useful for the purposes of image making. But what film is, is plastic in chemistry. Film is actually a chemical layer or a chemical, what we call a chemical emulsion, which is comprised of tiny microscopic silver crystals that we call silver halides. And these silver halides are suspended in a gelatin, which is like a jelly-like substance which serves to bond them to the acetate and spread them, evenly, uh, spread them evenly over it. And it's these silver halides, it's these silver crystals, which give film its sensitivity to light and therefore its potential for photography. Because when these silver crystals are exposed to light, they undergo a chemical transformation, whereby they start to harden into a more pure metallic silver. And when we take this film and we put it in a chemical solution like a developer, we actually encourage that chemical transformation even further, which is what leaves the imprint of the light that this image, that was, that was seen by the film. So the more light that the film receives, the more dense and therefore, you know, the more, more significant the light transformation or the chemical transformation. So, okay, that's fantastic. But how does that compare to digital? Well, actually, before we do that, I want to jump in and look at this cross-section of film. And as you can see, the key, the key component to film is this emulsion layer here, which, as I described, is comprised of silver halide crystals and gelatin. But what's interesting about this image is that film is actually comprised of a series of layers, which it's kind of interesting to me because when I look at film, I don't see layers. I just see like a thin strip 
which is to say that um, a lot of what you're seeing in this cross-section of film is happening at a really microscopic level. And even if I look at an unused piece of film and I look at the emulsion layer, I don't see crystals. So to me that speaks to the sophistication of film and how technically complicated it is. And the reason I think that's interesting is because sometimes we forget that film is actually a technology. We have a tendency to think about technology in terms of what's new and what's the latest and greatest in technology. But film is, should still be considered a technology. All right, so all that's really interesting, but how does that compare to digital? Well, when I take a photograph with a digital camera, in place of film, I have what we call a digital sensor, which is actually a light detector. And so when light hits that sensor, it's being broken up into millions of tiny little dots that we call pixels. And then the light detector, in concert with the camera's processor, is ascribing a numerical value to each one of those pixels. And so when we compare film to digital technology, what we're actually comparing is two fundamentally different technologies. We're still practicing photography. We've still got a lens that's passing light onto a two-dimensional plane. But the technology that's underwriting the image making of that two-dimensional plane is on the one hand chemical, or on the other hand, a computational and numeric digital recording. That is about as technical as I plan on getting this evening for two reasons. Firstly, sorry, firstly, that's, this is not really where my interest in film photography lies. Secondly, honestly, I've probably exhausted about 85% of my technical knowledge of film and digital photography. So, however, I, I do think it's worthwhile um, touching on the technical foundations of the mediums because it's good knowledge to have in terms of what we know about the materials that we're using and it's also going to help us animate some other questions that we're going to discuss this evening. I think a far more interesting question that needs to be looked at is why use film? In the 21st century with digital cameras and the technology that's available, why would you shoot film? And people often ask me this, why do you shoot film? And the honest answer is because I like it and because it's available. But that wouldn't lead for a very long lecture. So um, if I drill down a little bit further, the truth is, is that there isn't one reason that inspires me to shoot film. And I think if you were to ask a range of photographers that use film as their capture medium, what you would probably discover is that there's a series of things that shift and move in subtle ways when you use film instead of digital as your capture medium. <clears throat> and so this evening I want to pull out three elements that I think change somewhat when you, you move to film. The first one that I want to look at is this thing that people would describe as the look of film. The second thing I want to look at is the method and the workflow that accompanies an approach with film. And the third thing that we're going to look at is some of the different possibilities that open up when you use film as your capture medium. So let's jump in and have a look. The film look. When people describe images that are made on film, they have this tendency to use words like vintage and classic and retro and timeless. These are words that are often associated with film imagery. And part of the reason for this, I feel, is because in many respects, the look of film forms part of our shared visual history. If you think about it, digital photography is really only 15 or 20 years old, whereas film is like well over a century old. And if we go back and we look at the great photographs of the 20th century, the vast, vast majority of those images were made using film stock. And so from a visual point of view, we have this shared history. And when we go back and we look at imagery that represents our history and great social movements, we're doing so from a visual sense by looking at film. Images from World War II and the way the Vietnam War was represented from a visual sense is bound up in the look of film stock. And if 
we look at this image here, which is arguably one of the most, if not the most iconic image of the 20th century and the most famous front cover of one of the most famous photographic magazines, National Geographic, that look, which we've all seen, is not only, um, it's not only an amazing image, but it's, it's something that we all carry around, the look that film provides. And uh, great moments in history, like man landing on the moon, all these have been shot on film. And so there is this tendency that when we look at a film image that's made today, because it can carry some of the similar aesthetics, we tend to impart a certain degree of nostalgia to the, to the aesthetic of film. And it's not just our shared visual history, but indeed our personal visual history. Because when I think about my childhood and, I, and, and, and the photos that I have from my childhood, all of those were shot on film. And I'm sure for a lot of us, the photographs that we've seen of our parents' wedding or the, or the photographs of our grandparents' wedding were also shot on film. And so we do have this bank of images that forms our past, both shared and personal, that, is, that has been shot on film. So there is this interesting psychological piece there. But there is also a look to film. And I was sort of in two minds about going into the detail of the look of film in this lecture for a couple of reasons. One, because it's not necessarily the primary driver as to why I shoot film. And secondly, it is getting trickier to tell with 100% certainty the difference between film and digital. And certainly in the last five years, we've seen the advent of downloadable presets and highly sophisticated editing programs and a whole bunch of Skillshare videos demonstrating how you can perform clever actions in Photoshop to make your digital files look like film. But notwithstanding, I still feel that if I jump on Flickr and Instagram, I can find bodies of imagery that unquestionably have the look of film and could only have been made on film. Just like I can find photographs that sit at the other end of the spectrum that are unquestionably made with digital technology. Now, there is this bigger gray area that is hard to tell, but I still think that there is some benefit in having a look at what film imagery is look, looks like, or that filmic look. So what we're going to do now is jump into a series of images, and I'm, I'm going to run through them reasonably quickly, but I just want to sort of pull out some of the characteristics that I feel are emblematic and characteristic of film photography. So the first two photographs that I want to look at are, to me, characteristic of the way film can have <clears throat> not just a classic look, but a simplicity and a beauty and an honesty to the aesthetic. And one of the things that strikes me about this image is, okay, first of all, it's a very beautiful model. He's put her in soft light, which is great for portraiture. But there is, there is an, an aesthetic to this to the way that the tones of this photograph come together, which is, has a really classic film look. And in addition to this classic rendering of the tones, if you look at the shadow areas of this image, the photographer hasn't gone to any pains to try and pull them out. Um, areas in the background where there are trees and even some of the detail in her jeans is, is really, um, I wouldn't say dim, but it hasn't been it hasn't been pulled out. And even when you look at her skin tones and um, the highlight areas on the wisps of her hair and her shirt, the photograph hasn't been made to shine and pop like we have a tendency in digital imagery to do. It's just, it's just a really honest, simple, beautiful photograph. And this image is, is pretty similar. I feel like the way that the tones come together in this image are also really emblematic of the way black and white film stock can be used uh, in open shade. And in particular, what I find interesting about this photograph is if we would have shot this on digital, I feel as though there would have been a tendency to increase the luminance values and make the, around the subject and essentially make that subject brighter. Because with digital, we have the ability in our senses to recover all the shadow detail that's just not really possible with film. And yet, I think this film has, this image, sorry, has a unique look to it, or a distinct look. 
in that it's really honest. And it's an honest representation of the way the light was in this scene. And it has a simplicity that I think is often missing in a lot of the digital imagery that we see. Uh, I put a landscape image in here <clears throat> because black and white film remains very, very popular amongst landscape photographers. And one of the attractions to film is the way in which the emulsion records light. And part of the reason I had that technical discussion at the start was to introduce this idea that on the one hand, we've got a technology that's producing numbers to understand light. And on the other hand, we have a technology that's really just silver being exposed and reacting to light. And when I take a photograph with a digital camera, the sensor is going to record a number between 0 and 256. And all those numbers are going to be hard in whole integers. So at some point, each pixel has to make a decision about what number it's going to be, either 135 or 138, or 137, or whatever it's going to be. But there's no numerical description in film. And so all you've got is silver reacting to light. And what results very often is a smooth gradation in the tones and between the tones in film photography that has a very beautiful aesthetic that's unique to film. And this image is not a bad example, um, is, is a pretty good example of that. I feel in a whole bunch of areas in the foreground, in particular where the waterfall is and some of the rocks in the foreground, as well as in the foliage in the background, there are areas where the photograph just has a really beautiful spread of tones. And film has this uh, very distinct, unique way of recording light that is different to digital and can create a distinct, if not subtle, look in your imagery. The next two images that we're going to have a look at are more classic styles of portraiture. And uh, I think in both the next two images you see a very similar phenomenon in the background areas of the photograph. They're essentially blurred, where the tonal values in the wall are, just, are, having that, are doing the same thing where even though there's really one bank of tone, there's a much less clinical rendering of that tone in film. In film. And one of the other aspects that I personally am really enamored with in film photography is the presence of grain. And in both these two portraits, all that we really have in terms of what's in focus in the image is the subject's eyes. And nearly everything else is out of focus. And what I notice in a lot of portraits that are made on film is that as soon as you lose acuity in the image, the film grain takes over. And that lovely bokeh that we love to see in our images actually starts to blend and swirl with the visual characteristic of the grain, which creates a really beautiful aesthetic. Um, I must admit, they don't necessarily come up that well in a downloadable scan that's then been projected onto a screen, but it is a visual presence that you can find in a lot of film imagery. Um, it's potentially a little bit more visible in this image. Um, and I, like I said, I really like the aesthetic that black and white film brings to portraiture in this regard. Um, but in addition to the look, I actually like the idea that the physical characteristic of the medium is starting to impose and show itself in the image. And I liken it to, you know, when I go to a big city and I go to a museum, I love going to look at uh, oil canvas paintings. I just really like the way they look. And one of the things that I love about them is that when you look at a, an oil on canvas, in many instances, you can see the fibrous nature of the canvas bleeding through the tacky quality of an oil canvas painting. And I like the idea that the materials that the artist chooses starts to actually present itself in a physical and an aesthetic way on the medium. And in the same way, I think, Film grain has that possibility to add some depth, some texture to our imagery. The next two images that I'm going to show, so we're going to shift to some colored imagery now. And the next two images that I am going to show, um, I really, I really, um, I brought up because one of the things that people fall in love with when they shoot film, 
and that really gets them shooting film is a particular film stock. And when you, when you, when you buy a roll of film, you're not just buying a roll of film, you're actually buying like 15 or 20 years of aesthetic and technical research and development by a, a, a company like Kodak. And so what you're actually buying into is decades of R&D about what a film can look like and, and what a film should be used to do. And back in the film days, you know, there were certain films that were really popular with wedding and portrait photographers because they had a particular aesthetic. And then there were other films that were more prevalently used by landscape photographers. And then, you know, there were different films again for documentary and photojournalists. And one of the beautiful things about shooting film and shooting a particular stock is that you can start to let the stock do the work of managing your aesthetic as well as help you see, help you understand and translate color as you look at it in the world and be able to pre-visualize how that's going to be rendered on a piece of film. Now this particular piece of this particular film stock is Kodak Ektar, which is a which is a pretty fun film stock. It has a tendency to produce very punchy and very very punchy and saturated colors as well as strong contrast. And this is sort of represented in the way that even in a scene like this, which is late in the day, it's a long exposure, it has soft softish light, it's still pulling out a lot of vivid color from the sea, the air, like the aqua color in the sea and the sky. And it's also picking up this beautiful pinkish um, light in the clouds. And you can also see ever so slightly like the subtle effect of grain in the sky. If we compare that photo with this one, this is a completely different film stock. This is a film stock called Portra 400, which is arguably the most popular film stock available today. And Portra has a completely different aesthetic. Portra essentially has a very muted pastel color palette. And it has a tendency of pushing your reds and your yellows and your oranges into a muted space. And it's done, it's done so specifically because it's used to shoot portraits, hence the name Portra. And it has a tendency of producing really beautiful uh, skin tones. And even with people who have not necessarily the most beautiful skin, you can rely on it to push any funny pigmentation into the background. Now this photographer has decided to shoot Portra in a landscape and in this landscape desert setting. And what's notable is the way that that muted color palette has translated what would often be a really bright, colorful scene. And it creates a very particular aesthetic. And it's just gorgeous. I mean, it's just a really gorgeous film stock and it's done a really beautiful job of, uh, of rendering this scene. Um, and again, you know, in some of these shadow areas, you're starting to see the presence of grain. And that's common in film photography where you have a little bit of underexposure, you might start to see a little bit of grain. And if it's really strongly underexposed, that's going to look bad, that's going to look strong. But when it's subtle like this, again, I feel like it adds some texture to the image. Um, the next two photographs I just wanted to show, just to continue this conversation about portrait and about using a film stock to your advantage. This is really the classic, iconic use of portrait. You can see what it's done to this woman's skin, although she does have very beautiful skin anyway, but it is a really beautiful rendering. And you can also see the way in which the color palette is used in a different set of colors in, in a different light source. The other reason I highlighted this, I chose this photograph to talk about is because of the way in which color, it's a good example of the way in which color negative film will resolve a, what we call a really wide dynamic range, which is really just a way of saying that it can record a, a very large spectrum of light. And this is again one of the most iconic uses of portrait where particularly the photograph on the right hand side, um, the photo, essentially it's a backlit portrait and this woman's face is in open shade and the photographer has exposed for her face and yet the areas in the background here have not completely blown out in the, in the way that they would with digital. If you were photographing this on digital, there would be a tendency for these background areas just to be a blinking screen and there'd be no information there. And 
whilst they are definitely very, very light, what's essentially happened is that part of the negative has just absolutely been flooded. And the result is that, you know, there's very little detail there, but in a physical sense, there's still something on the neg. And the result from an image point of view is that we're still able to pull out a little bit of color, which adds a little bit of visual depth in the image. Right, yeah, and well, sometimes it does. Like, and in this image, you can actually see a little bit of color fringing along the trees in the background. So, um, yeah, my experience is that you know, digital often provides us the ability to fix that. Although you can still edit film scans. So, um, I wanted to put this image in just as another example um, of the way in which color negative film allows you to shoot in a backlit situation. It covers a really wide spectrum of light. And again, the skin tones are perfectly rendered. And whilst the background is incredibly bright, if you compare the tones, they still have color in them compared to pure white. And it just creates a beauty and an aesthetic that I think is more, is more difficult to create with, with digital cameras. It's not that you can't do it, but in this type of scene, you're gonna have to balance your exposure and then pull your shadows back. And sometimes that can pull out some weird artifacts. Um, you're also going to have to play around with your color and your preset and whatever to get the result. Whereas when you shoot film, you just get the aesthetic of the film. Um, I want to look at two more images quickly, um, which are both examples of night photography. The first thing I think about when I, the first thing that comes to mind when I see this photograph is, uh, golly jeepers, I haven't had fairy floss in a long, long time. But the second thing that comes to mind is, wow, look at the color casts that have been thrown by the light in this image. And the reason for that is that the vast, vast majority of film that's available today, and, and even back in the day this was the case, is balanced for the color of daylight. And if we were to shoot this in digital, it wouldn't take very long for someone to come up and tap us on the shoulder and be like, uh, white balance, I think maybe you need to yank on your slider there in Lightroom and like kind of balance this out a bit. But to my mind and to my eye, the color that's being cast by the, light, the lights in this image actually add a great deal to this photograph. And in particular, they add a lot of mood and drama and they are incredibly evocative of place. I almost feel like I'm drawn into the night, I'm drawn into this image because it sees the way I see and it hasn't been corrected. I like it. Um, this is another image that's been shot using uh, actually Portra 400, uh, essentially a daylight balance color negative film. And again, you can see the way in which the film stock is rendering the color cast from the lights in the background. And there's also like this really beautiful, subtle rendering of the film grain just due to the exposure. And again, I'm, I'm not sure that we would be inclined to manage our color in this way while we're shooting digitally. And so it gives us the possibility and invites us to, to play with color in a different way. The other thing that I think is notable about this image is that, uh, you know, I was there with Phil when he made this photograph actually, and it was a four minute exposure. And he probably could have made a 15 or a 20 minute exposure and he still wouldn't have got any detail in the shadows because this is really what film photography at night looks like. Film just does not have the power of the digital sensor. And were we to make this photograph on a digital camera, the sensor would be a lot more powerful and we would also have a very strong inclination to put it on a tripod, take 15 photographs and then stack them in Lightroom and create an image with a lot more detail in the shadows. And yet it would be a very different photograph with a very different look. And the fact that there is very little um, shadow detail I think gives the, the photograph a lot of mood. I also think that it makes these puddles that are reflecting this beautiful light in the sky so much more dramatic. And there's some of these puddles that just like ever so slightly picking up the light. And so I think these last two photographs are interesting because uh, 
When people do these, oh, film versus digital debates, one of the big ones is, well, film is so much better in low light and film is so much better, you know, when, when the light source is not daylight balanced. And yet, here are two really distinctive examples of images that have a very particular look um, that I'm not sure we would be inclined to make with a digital camera. So let's have a look at what I mean by the method and the workflow of film. Essentially, there is a discipline that comes from shooting film. I'm not sure many, how many people in the room or in the audience have shot film or still shoot film, but when you shoot film, it slows you down. It has to because it costs you money. Every time you press the shutter button, you're spending money. You have to buy film and you have to get it developed. And so while you often hear people say that the look of film is what got me into shooting film, it's often the way in which film makes me shoot that it really inspires people. And what I found is that film starts to change the way that you approach your photography. The first thing you do is you stop looking at the back of your LCD because there isn't one. And so all of a sudden, you very quickly start to change your relationship with your camera. Your camera is not there to help you check your exposure and your camera is not there to help you see. You have to start doing that yourself. You have to start doing that before. And film is a very productive um, way of not being able to cheat around that. Um, the other thing is that film starts to slow you down in terms of your process. You start to be a lot more patient. You start to do things like find good light. I check the weather a lot more when I'm shooting on film because I want to know if it's going to be sunny or if it's going to be overcast because that's probably going to tell me whether I want to shoot black or white or color. Um, and then even when you get into the moment and you find something that's interesting to shoot, you start to function with a lot more discipline because you've only got 36 exposures or, or less depending on your camera. And so you might say to yourself, all right, well, I only really want to make one photograph of this. So what do I want it to look like? And you start to work the scene and you start to think, okay, like, so in this photograph, do I want the sub, do I want the viewer to to see this from a distance or do I want this, them to see this close up? You start to, to do the work of making your photograph without having to go click, nah, click, nah. And some people find this a really inspiring and fulfilling way of working. Um, essentially, people describe their photography as being a lot more intentional. Now, I want to press pause here for a second and say, that you don't need to shoot film to do any of what I just said. You can shoot your digital cameras like that. All you have to do is turn your image review off and keep it off. And then you can set yourself challenges and say, all right, well, today I'm only going to make 10 photographs. I want to tell a story with 10 photographs. Or I'm going to go away this weekend and I'm only going to shoot what would be one roll. Like I'm going to shoot 36 frames. And see if you can keep yourself to that. And if it doesn't work for you, that's fine. But my experience with shooting in this way, particularly using film to shoot in this way, is that a couple of things happened. The first thing that happened is that I did start to get more keepers. I still made a lot of bad photographs that I didn't want to see ever again. But my percentage of keepers went up. The other thing that I noticed was that, and this is something that a lot of photographers will say, is that their photographs actually started to talk to one another in a more consistent way. Because because you're no longer able to shoot as many images as you want, you start to be more intensive and more deliberate about what you're photographing and how. And you start to actually see a vision and a consistency in your own images develop. There's also another thing that happens, which I think is very interesting, which is that you actually start to review your mistakes. And I feel the reason for that is because when you come back from a weekend of shooting with a digital camera, you've probably made 500 photographs. And the game then is, all right, I've got to sort through them, find the good ones, edit them, and there's so many mistakes, you don't have time to look at them. Whereas you have a roll of 36, even if you have, say, 10 photographs that you like, you have 26. And by the time that you get to the end of all those images, you've probably only clicked, you know, through your screen about, for about five minutes. And so you've got plenty of time to double back and have a look. And when you have so few photographs, you start to ask the question, okay, so that photograph didn't work. Why? What didn't I like about it? Like if I goof my exposure, was it my meter or was it me? If the composition doesn't work, 
what is it about the composition that doesn't work? Did I need to be closer? Well, should I have shot that at a, at a different aperture? Whatever it'll be. And I've started to notice that I actually carry that thinking with me back into the field. And I've had numerous instances where I'm, I'm, I'm making a photograph and I remember, I'm like, no, I don't like the way this lens does that. I, want, I need to change my perspective. Or I know that this is going to have too strong a, a shadow or whatever it'll be. So again, you know, you don't necessarily need to shoot film to do this. My experience is that film is a very productive restraint in this regard. And even though I've tried to carry some of that discipline of shooting film into my digital workflow, it's hard for me to keep it. That's just... Right. That's a re another really great point. When you shoot on film, you don't have metadata. You know, even when you get your scans, and we'll talk about scanning in a minute, uh, or later on in the lecture, you, you don't have any metadata in there. So you've got to remember like, what your inclination was. And like you said, a lot of photographers would write that information down so they could double back and, and have a look. Yeah, good point. So this is probably the area of the lecture that I was you know, most excited in delivering. Mm. It's also the main reason that I shoot film. And for me what happens is when you photograph with film, you open up a slew of new possibilities about what photography can be and look like uh, relative to digital. And in this regard I want to talk about two aspects in particular. I want to talk about negatives and I want to talk about cameras. Because we can't have a lecture about photography and not talk about gear, come on. So let's jump in and have a look. This diagram here is a representation of the relative size of digital sensors. In actual fact, this large full frame sensor is not as big as it gets. We do have digital medium format, but we all know how much it costs. And very few people in this room have the ability to own a digital media. I don't. So we're just going to leave that one to the side and talk about, you know, these are the sizes that are really available to us when we shoot digital. If we jump out of that diagram and jump into this one, what we have is a schematic of a range of different negative sizes that are available to us when we shoot film. And what's notable is in the top left-hand corner of this schematic is the size of 35mm film, which is the same size as what your digital sensor is going to produce. And that's actually as small as film gets. I mean, it does get a little bit smaller, but for all intents and purposes, that's really as small as film gets. So all of a sudden, you open up the possibility of shooting a big neg. And there are a couple of things that happen when you shoot a big negative. The first one is that you, you are gonna you're going to see a significant increase in the resolution of your image. You're going to have a negative that you can, pr that can print, print as big as you want, basically, or as big as you'll ever want you're also going to see a change in your depth of field. You're going to see images that have a lot less uh, in, in focus, a lot shallower depth of field. And the reason for that is in the same way, well, what's going to happen is you're going to be changing the relationship between your focal length and your angle of view. I want to talk about this briefly. Um, when we shoot digitally, we have a 35 millimeter camera with a 50 millimeter lens that's kind of what we consider the normal angle of view. If we were to take that 50 millimeter lens and put it on an APS-C crop sensor camera, we're no longer going to have the same angle of view. We're going to have a much, we're going to have essentially a short telephoto lens, like, an 80, like a 75 or an 80 millimeter lens. And in order to get the same angle of view, the same amount in my picture, I'm going to need a wide lens, like a 35 on an APS-C sensor. If I jump out of here again and jump back down here, I'm going the other way. So in order to get the equivalent angle of view of a 50 millimeter lens that's going to give me that normal look on a full frame or a 35 mil, I'm going to need something like an 80, a 100 or a 150 in the case of, large, of a large format 4x5 here. What doesn't change when you change focal length is the depth of field properties of that lens. And so when you shoot a big neg, you often have these very shallow depth of field portraits. And if I jump out of here momentarily and go back into some of these 
images that we were looking at when we looked at the look of film, uh, for example, this one, what we can see in this portrait is that everything is out of focus except for the subject. It has that really shallow depth of field that we've come to know in our telephoto lenses. But the angle of view of this image is like a 50. It's like a really normal angle of view. And again, it creates a very distinct, it's subtle, but it is a distinct look to the imagery. So that's negative size. Let's have a look at negative dimension. Because when we look at this schematic here, what we see is that not only are these negs bigger, but they actually have a different aspect ratio. A 35 millimeter piece of film, which is the same size and dimension as a full frame DSLR, has a two by three aspect ratio. And if we look at these three negative sizes here, what we see is that the aspect ratio is changes in each one of them. We have a four by three, which is boxier than a 35 mil. We have a six by six, which is a pure square. And we have a six by seven, which is uh, boxier than that, but not as boxy as a square. And what's interesting here is that in digital photography, we have a tendency to think about aspect ratio when we're editing and when we're printing or when we're trying to put files on Instagram. But in film photography, what we actually have is the ability to start to compose with a different shaped box, with a different shaped uh, image. And my proposition to you is that this also opens up different possibilities about what photography can be. So we're going to park that idea for a second and just talk about cameras momentarily. When you shoot film, you open up a whole new weird and wonderful world of camera and gears and gear, which is good and bad. And when I say new world, what I really mean is old world because all these cameras are really old. And the truth of the matter is, that the vast majority of digital cameras that are available function like SLRs. They don't all look like SLRs. Even the mirrorless cameras that have a sleek design and a, and a different form factor, they still function like an SLR. And when we go back into the history of film photography, there are a whole plethora of different types of cameras that actually work differently and that function differently. And so what we're going to do now is, well, I just want to say that my proposition is when you, if you accept that photography is an art form and for us, for the artists, it's as much about the process of making the photograph as it is about the result and you change one of the tools that you use to make your art that's going to make you work differently, then you can start to make different types of photographs. So what I want to do this evening is to pull out one particular type of camera and look at it and then look at some imagery that you can make with this type of camera. Now I could have chosen, um, I could have given a whole other lecture on camera types and I, or I could have chosen like a couple of different types of cameras but I've chosen this particular one because it's one that I have some experience with and it will give me the opportunity to talk about my own personal experience and workflow and look and kind of tie some of this stuff together. So let's jump in and have a look. The camera that we're going to be looking at this evening is called a rangefinder. And the rangefinder camera was, in actual fact, the very first 35 millimeter camera that was mass produced. This camera right here. This camera was the Leica One, which was released in 1927. And like I said, this camera was the first camera that was mass produced to take 35 millimeter film. Because before this camera, film photography used bigger negatives or like glass and tin that was covered in silver. And 35 millimeter film was really just used to make cinema at the time. But a gentleman by the name of Oscar Barnack, who was living in Germany, he was a keen photographer. He worked in an industrial plant that made uh, microscopes and lenses and the like and happened to be a keen photographer and he also happened to be an asthmatic and what he wanted was a portable camera and so he conceived of this camera and this camera is also a rangefinder now I don't want to talk about rangefinders by looking at this camera because it's such got such a weird iconic 1920s look to it I want to show you what a modern rangefinder looks like this 
is what a modern rangefinder looks like. And this camera was actually produced in the 2000s. So this is a new camera, a new film camera. And there are a couple of things that are significant about this camera. The first, the, the main point that we need to understand about rangefinders is that they don't have a mirror in them. You can kind of consider them the first mirrorless cameras, but they're not really the first mirrorless cameras. They look like mirrorless cameras, but anyway, they don't have a mirror. So that's going to change the way they work. And I want to talk a little bit about what a mirror does in an SLR before we talk about the absence of a mirror and what that's going to mean. The mirror in an SLR is not there for the lols. It's there for a very particular purpose, and that is for us to allow ourselves to use the lens to do two things. The first thing the lens is going to do is the thing it's going to do in every single camera. It's going to transmit light into the box and, and help us to record an image. But with a mirror in that box, we are able to use the lens to do something else. We're able to look into the pentaprism of the viewfinder, down onto the mirror and out the lens, thereby using the lens to focus and frame. The, the lens is the thing that is helping us to frame and focus. We don't have a mirror in a rangefinder camera. So that's going to change the way the tool works. There's so a couple of things I want to look at just quickly before we jump into how you frame and focus with a rangefinder camera. The first one is rangefinders are noted for their very sleek design. And the reason for that is that uh, if you look at this image at the top right, you'll see that the box has a really flat squared off profile, like you would see on a mirrorless camera, because there's no mirror box chamber for the mirror to flip up and down. What you also note is that the lenses often have a more diminutive size because more of the lens can retreat into the box. There's no mirror moving that's going to hit it. They also have like a flat top profile because we don't have a pentaprism. So mirrorless cameras, sorry, rangefinder cameras have always been lighter, smaller, and they're also quieter because when you push the button, there's no mirror flapping out the way. It's just the shutter firing. And even back in the days, in the 1970s and 1960s, these cameras were really popular with people who wanted to photograph in a discreet manner. But what's more important is the absence of, absence of, the, of the mirror. And before we jump out of this image, I want to point out one last thing, which is that the viewfinder on this camera is located here, on the top right of the camera. And what's different is that typically our viewfinders are located in the middle at the top, so that they're in alignment with the lens. Okay, so basically what I'm trying to tell you is that the rangefinder gives you a different way of viewing and framing. Let's have a look. This is what it's like to look through the viewfinder of a rangefinder. And there's a couple of things that are really interesting. The first one is that when you look through this viewfinder, you're basically looking through a window. Just like the way you look through a window in your house or the window in your car. You're not looking through the lens, you're just looking from one end, from the back of the box, through a window and out the front of the box. And therefore, you can see everything at focus at once, just like I can see everything in focus as I see and talk to you right now. The second thing that's notable is that inside that window are a series of frame lines, which are indicative of what my lens is going to see. And rangefinders are designed such that when you take one lens off and you put another lens on, those frame lines change to represent you know, what, your, what your lens is going to see. And in this image, they've given us two sets of frame lines just to underscore the point of difference. And we can say that this external line here would be what it would be like to look through a 35 millimeter lens or what we, would, what we would have if we had a 35 millimeter lens. And this internal box here might be a 50 millimeter lens. <clears throat> What's interesting is that when I like throw, look through a rangefinder camera, I can see more than what's in my photo. I can see everything in focus at once, and I can see more than what's in my image. And I want to just jump out and have a look at this set of images just to underscore what it would look like with an SLR. On the left-hand side here, we have two images that represent what the viewfinder of a rangefinder looks like. I have a window, everything is in focus, and I have a set of frame lines that allows me to compose with, but I can see more than what's in my photograph. Here we have two images that represent what it would look like to have to look at the same scene through the viewfinder of an SLR. 
I can only see what my lens sees. I can only see what's going to be in my picture and I can only see what's in focus relative to where my lens is focused. So in this top right hand image, my point of focus is in the foreground, probably on the handlebar of this bike here, which means that the rest of my image is blurred to me. I can't really see what's going on. And in this bottom photograph, the opposite is true. My point of focus is at infinity and it's the foreground that's blurred. And it's not that one is better than the other, but they do give the photographer a very different way of viewing in the world. Let's jump back to this other image. The reason people find rangefinder cameras attractive is the opportunity for a change in experience that it allows for when you're framing and focusing. Because I can start to make my picture. I can start to make decisions about where my, where my frame starts and ends. I can start to play with composition at the same time as I can monitor the world around it. Which means it's an incredibly useful tool to photograph in fluid environments, in places where you don't have access, or in situations where you're trying to anticipate a photograph. Whereas with an SLR, I'd have to be looking up and I wouldn't be able to see everything in focus depending on where my focal point is. The rangefinder is different. One last point, I haven't actually told you how you focus with a rangefinder. So this patch in the middle is essentially my focusing patch. And wherever I point that patch, there's going to be a ghost image. And as I move the barrel focus, the barrel, the lens, the focus barrel on the lens, that ghost image is going to move. And when they're lined up, that part of the photograph is in focus. Uh, I won't go into the technical hows of how that operates because it's not very interesting, but that's how it works. And so I'm essentially resolving the problematic of my focus with one tiny patch and then the rest of the viewfinder is free for me to look through in a really engaging way and frame in the manner that I've described. <clears throat> I want to have a look at some imagery made with rangefinder cameras. Does anyone recognize this photograph? Anyone in the audience? A few people, it's pretty famous. This photograph was taken by the French street photographer and photojournalist Henri Cartier-Bresson. It's probably one of his most famous images. And you can see the way in which, and, and, this, and this photograph was shot with a rangefinder. It was shot with one of the original Leicas, I suspect. And what's fundamental to this photograph is the point at which the shutter was tripped. You know, Henri Cartier-Bresson coined the term the decisive moment. If this photograph gets made one second before or one second later, it's not the same photograph. And you can imagine him being able to look through a tool where he can see out onto the world in a really clear way. And he's also able to see more than what's in his photograph. You can imagine him making a decision about his composition with a really clear window. I want, I want these lines to be at a rule of thirds and I want the mirror to be here and I want some space in between these two subjects here. You can see how the rangefinder would allow you to, to play with that in a different way. Now, you can make that photograph with an SLR, but it's going to be a different experience. Let's have a look at this photograph here. This is made by uh, one of my favorite photographers, uh, the American photographer Gary Winogrand. So also, he also shot with a rangefinder. And again, in this image, the decisive moment is critical. To me, I think this image really hangs on the fact that there are a series of hand gestures that have been captured at the same time. And there's also a real beautiful symmetry in the way he's lined up all the elements. I feel like he might have been waiting for this car to fill up some space and create some visual interest here. As well as I can also imagine him being able to see more than what's in his photograph and looking out onto this scene, surveying it, waiting, and then when he has these series of hand gestures making the photograph. The other thing I really love about this photograph is this little guy down here. I don't know if it's because uh, he's like younger than his sister and her friend or because he's not girly enough, but they won't let him play happy clappy. Not to be deterred, he's like playing his own little game by himself down there and it just creates this third little beautiful hand gesture. And the fact you can't see his face also gives a little bit of mystery. Um, the next two set of images are made by an, another American photographer called Alex Webb. And to me, this is a really uh, 
good illustration of what a rangefinder can, how a rangefinder can allow you to photograph. You've got a lot of information in the foreground and a whole bunch of really decisive important information in the background and the fact that he's looking through a tool that doesn't put one of them out of focus helps him to make this photograph. He's also, you know, decided in a really dramatic and interesting way about where he wants his photograph to start and finish. This guy is chopped off and part of her face is chopped off. And the way in which the photograph is laid, he's got this guy hanging down, he's got these feet sticking out, he's got the tiniest amount of play equipment just giving us a little anchor on the edge of the frame. And I feel like, again, this is a really good example of how rangefinders are meant to be used. Um, I wanted to include this last image for a couple of reasons. It has some of the similar traits that we've been discussing, but um, what's relevant, I think, is that uh, the photographer has not gone unnoticed in this scene. This kid and this uh, woman have noticed the photographer, which is not surprising. Alex Webb shot a lot in Haiti and Cuba and Istanbul, and he's a white American, so it's not like he's not going to not get noticed. But because rangefinders were kind of like the original mirrorless cameras, they were shot by people who were photographing in public a lot because they're smaller and they're quieter. And even when you go, even when you don't go unnoticed, it's not as big and offensive a camera to use. And that's one of the reasons that draws people into shooting mirrorless cameras is that they're great for photographing in public because they're just less uh, obtrusive. And that's the case with rangefinder cameras as well. And the other thing I like about this image is, is the green, that garish green light that the color negative film is pulling up and the way that it bounces off the crimson sunset in the sky, I think is just really evocative and a really just a beautiful use of film. Okay, so now I wanna share some photographs that I've made and um, I'm just going to jump right in. The, these photographs were made with this camera that I own. And this camera is a rangefinder camera. It bears many of the similar design characteristics of the rangefinder cameras that we've been looking at. But this camera is unique in that it is a panoramic camera. So it actually shoots a frame that has a different shape. And it does that by virtue of a different shutter size. It has a panoramic shutter. So it shoots 35 millimeter film, but instead of shooting a traditional 2x3, 24, 36 mil negative, it shoots a 24 by 65. So it shoots a really wide negative, which means that when I put a roll of 36 exposure film in that camera, I don't get 36 exposures. I only get like 21 because it's using more of the film to shoot each photograph. And um, I was attracted to this camera because at the time I was shooting a lot of street and documentary photography and I had a tendency to shoot with wide angle lenses like 28 mils and 35 mil lenses because it allowed me to capture a lot of the scene. It allowed me to get close to people and give you an intimate feel of space whilst also being able to pull in some details of the environment. And when I found this camera online, just like reading reviews and, and looking at camera nerdery, nerd stuff, I was blown away for two reasons. One, the frame to my eye opened up a whole new set of possibilities about how I could play with composition, how I could play with space. But it also allowed me to shoot a wide angle photograph without the wide angle distortion. And the reason for that is got to do with the size and the negative. The lens that I have for this camera is a 45 millimeter lens, which is basically a 50. It's basically got a really normal perspective on a 35 mil camera, except because I'm shooting a wide negative, a negative that would be the equivalent almost of a six by seven medium format neg, the angle of view that I'm pulling in on the wide end is like a 24, except I don't have the distortion in the corners of a 24. And it really started to change the way I saw wide angle. This is a really good example of my ability to shoot wide, but still keep a really clean, balanced view. And it sort of became like the way that I saw 
a street image. It allowed me to um, represent space, but not have these garish uh, perspective distortions that I was sometimes getting at the 28 end. This is a really good example of what this camera is capable of. I've got this gentleman um, who's like a spice merchant in Morocco, and he's placed on the far edge of uh, the frame. Now, if I was to shoot this with a 24 mil, he, his face would probably start to be like bending a little bit. But because this camera sees differently, I get to get him and everything else in, in a really nice perspective, basically. The camera also allowed me to play with space in a new way um, and play with lining up elements, creating visual interest. Um, it kind of began to redefine what negative space meant. This type of image is kind of only possible with a panoramic frame. And I was showing a buddy of mine this photo and he's like, oh, cool. What does 16 by 9 look like? And it was like this. <laughs> he was like, holy smokes, like, that's such a wide frame. Um, and the fact that it was a rangefinder camera made it really light, really portable, and really in, um, discreet to photograph with. And in actual fact, this camera is unique in the sense that the vast majority of panoramic cameras that shoot a really wide neg are made for landscape photographers. They're big, they're heavy, and they need to be used with a tripod. And this camera, whoever came up with this camera, had the idea what would happen if we put the panoramic frame in a rangefinder such that instead of the panoramic frame being the intellectual property of landscape photographers, what could we do in the street domain, in photojournalism, in documentary, or even just everyday shooting in conceptual art? And, and as you can see in this imagery, it became my everyday camera. Um, the other thing that you'll notice up until this point is that all I did was run black and white film through this camera. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, I can develop it at home, so it's cheap. And secondly, at the time, I was shooting in black and white. And one of the things that I got tired of was the process of editing. And we all get tired of the process of editing, right? But in particular, I began to find it frustrating and a little disingenuous when I got home of turning my raw files into black and white. And I loved getting my scans in, and all I had to do was like move brightness, move contrast a little bit, and I was done. And I stopped seeing color on my screen, which had another effect, which was that I actually started to be able to walk around and see in black and white, because all I did photographically was see in black and white on my, on my computer when I had my film scans. And it was a really like, eye-opening and enjoyable experience to be able to look at a scene and be able to pre-visualize on the basis of images that I'd seen beforehand with that stock, how this scene was gonna be rendered. Now, I didn't get it right every time. I made a ton of terrible images. I'm only showing you the good ones. But it was a real, really refreshing experience. And again, here's another example of, you know, using a frame within a frame, but it's just different. I'm gonna jump through the, I think I've said enough. I'm gonna jump through the imagery pretty quickly. I, I took it on holiday when my wife and I went to Morocco and it was the only camera that I took. And you know, I made some really fun images. Again, just using basic compositional tools, but um, playing with them with a different frame, um, you know, shooting down on a subject. Until I had owned it for about a year and I was gonna shoot a documentary project in a refugee camp in the north of France. And the panoramic frame had become so normal to me that I decided to use this panoramic camera to shoot it. And that's exactly what I did. And it creates a really visually distinct image. And it became so second nature to me that I was able to create like a body of photographs, landscapes, portraiture, some action shots, um, some detail shots, and create you know, a body of 25, 30 photographs to represent a place and a time uh, with a completely unique vision. Um, I'll just bounce through a selection that I've pulled down for the purposes of this presentation. I even shot you know, some portraiture with it. When I bought this camera, it wasn't my intention to make portraits with it. And I, I feel like the camera lends itself to environmental portraiture rather than you know, traditional classic portraiture, but still 
Um, so yeah, a um, couple, th couple things. First of all, you could shoot digitally and crop to the same aspect ratio. But because you're not shooting an actual image sensor that's the same size, you'd essentially be taking, instead of an egg like this, you'd be taking a sensor like this and making it even smaller. It's going to create a different visual look. Secondly, nobody does this. Nobody thinks to shoot like this because they just don't. So when you shoot film, and this is just one example, you have the ability to have your creativity moved and shifted into a new location by virtue of the way the stock reads light, the way a camera can see, the way the tool operates, whatever it'll be. And this is the tip of the iceberg. This is just one example. I'm not suggesting anyone should go out and buy a panoramic camera. Um, I could have shown a TLR, I could have shown a Holger, we could have looked at large, view, large, view, uh, large format view cameras. But I chose a panoramic camera because it gave me the opportunity to tell you what my experience was like, as well as tie in some of the elements that we've been discussing about how film looks and et cetera, et cetera. Hey, yeah. Someone on chat is asking what camera that is. I will tell you right now. This camera is called, um, so my camera is called the Hasselblad X-Pan. And it actually is also sold as the Fuji TX-1. It was actually a collaboration between Fuji and Hasselblad. They're the exact same camera, the exact same lenses. It's actually made by Fuji in Japan, but when it was sold outside of Japan, it was sold as a Hasselblad. And the main difference is that mine is like got a charcoal quality and the Fuji one is silver. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I was, I was also gonna show you, just as a point of difference, a video of a photographer, you know, shooting film and shooting a very different type of camera and a very different image. And uh, for reasons of time and bandwidth, we're not gonna look at that video, but Forrest has been good enough to put it in the description. And I'll just talk about it really quickly um, because I think it is interesting. This gentleman in the video, or there's actually three photographers in this video. And I was gonna show you um, the first gentleman who's shooting a large format pinhole camera. So he's shooting a camera that has, that's called a pinhole camera and it has uh, no lens. It has no shutter, it has no aperture blades. All it is is a box with a laser cut uh, hole in the front. And on that laser cut hole is like a little plastic cap and you take the cap off to expose the film and then you put the cap back on. That's like your shutter mechanism. No lens, that's it. So it's an incredibly, it's basically as simple as you can make photography. But He's actually shooting a large format camera. The camera takes a piece of film that is four by five inches, I, th I think. I'm pretty sure it's definitely a, like a large neck. So he's counterbalancing the fact that he's got a really primitive image making device with an incredibly powerful, like big piece of film. And there's only like three or four images that pop up in the video. And you can probably Google him and find some more of his work. But what was notable to me was a couple of things. One, he has a really interesting way about describing what it's like to shoot that camera and why he's using that camera to, to create a mood and a feeling that's reminiscent of his childhood. And what's also notable is the, the aesthetic and the visual quality of the imagery, which is um, characterized, I think, by a really beautiful filmic look, but a really simple, um, almost like an absence of sharpness. Like it's got a real dream-like blurry quality. So if you want to have a look at that, um, by all means have a look at the video that I left in the description. There's also another gentleman who shoots a large format camera and, that's, and he's doing his own like different printing. So, so that's also really interesting. But um, I want to just touch on a couple of things to wrap up. First of all, I want to reiterate the point that it's not a question of film or digital. You know, I don't think we need to be slavish. There is a tendency in, our, in photography for everything to be polarized. Like you're a Nikon shooter or you're a Canon shooter or you shoot DSLR or you shoot mirrorless. And there is a film versus digital debate that goes on. And my advice to you is just don't waste your time with it. Um, it's 21st century. We are fortunate to live in an era where we can shoot both and they both have their different advantages and disadvantages and possibilities. Um, the second thing I want to say is that 
There is actually some advantages of shooting film in the 21st century. And the first one comes to, the main one I want to talk about here is digitization. One of the things that really, you know, irked me when I was a young student learning photography on film was that it cost so much money. And the thing that really bugged me was getting my, getting my prints back and only having like four or five prints, but having to pay for them all and then not knowing what to do with these extra prints. Like I didn't really want to throw them away because I paid for them, but I didn't want to look at them. So they sat in a shoebox and got moldy under the house. And we don't need to do that anymore. So one of the things, like the standard workflow for most digital photographers is to shoot their film, have it developed either by themselves or by a lab, and then have it scanned. And the scan is actually the new contact sheet. And, you know, uh, towards the end of the lecture, I'm going to just introduce you some basic, I'm going to uh, show you some introductory resources and we'll look at scanners that you might look at if you want to get into this. But a decent entry level scanner will run you about 100 bucks, maybe 150 at most. And, you know, that's really like the cost of getting maybe five or 10 rolls of film done. And once you have that, you can start to scan your images for free and then make prints of the ones that you like. The other advantage of scanning is that you can use modern editing, uh, soft, um, modern image editing software programs like Lightroom and Photoshop to do adjustments to your images. And you can also have those photographs printed with an inkjet printer. So you're not forced to have a dark room to get your uh, image into the real world and have a real life print in your hands. You can use an inkjet printer. So uh, there is this sort of hybrid workflow that's available to you where you can shoot film and digital together alongside or you know whatever and uh, you're also able to make use of modern technology to improve your workflow with film. I think that's really all there is to say about that. Um, the last point I'll, I'll make, I just wanted to, um, I know there might be a lot of people in the online audience who haven't shot film before or if they have they haven't shot it in a while so a few tips to get started. My best tip is that the best camera you have is the one you have with you. And a lot of these cameras are just floating out in the world and no one, everyone's forgotten about them. And there's a really decent chance that someone in your family, like your uncle or your aunt or your grandfather, has a camera that you can have. That you can just like take from them and walk down to, you know, to Walmart or to your local Photoshop and put a roll of film and you're away. So that's my first tip is Ask, if you want to get into film photography, ask some people in your family or friends whether there's a camera lying around that you can try. Um, you know, obviously there are online resources you can buy from eBay. KEH is a really reliable place to buy a camera from. Camera from. Uh, they have a really good returns policy. Uh, B&H and Adorama also have used sections. In terms of cameras that you can shoot, I don't really like pointing people in the direction of cameras, but um, there's a couple of points worth making. If you're a Canon or a Nikon shooter, there are film cameras that you can use with your current lens setup, which is kind of cool. And I've listed a couple of models there. In the Nikon line, there's an F100 and the F90X, which will work with all the modern digital lenses. Uh, with Canon, I'm pretty sure those are the, the EOS 1V and the EOS 3 will work. Um, otherwise, you know, there are great, there, there are a lot of really great manual focus entry level cameras. I've listed a couple here, um, the Nikon FE, the Canon AE1, the Pentax K1000, um, the Olympus OM series. Um, for our local audience, there is still a place that develops film. Um, called The Dark Room, which is on Main Street. And the guy who runs that shop has an absolute wealth of cameras. Uh, you'll definitely be able to get yourself set up pretty cheap. Tell Michael Callum sent you if you go in there. Um, so yeah, that's cameras. In terms of film stocks, um, Kodak Gold and Kodak Ultramax are really classic films. Um, I'm not actually sure Fuji Superior is still around, but you might be able to find some of it. Those are really cheap film stocks to get you started. The two film stocks that we talked about in a little bit more detail were Kodak Portrait and, and Ektar. Portrait is an incredibly forgiving film. It's a great film to start with. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's beautiful. Um, in terms of black and white, Kodak Tri-X, again, a really forgiving film. If you're not really confident about nailing your exposure, 
it's a really, it's a film that if you goof a stop and a bit either side, you're still going to get a really usable photo. Um, Ilford makes some great black and white films as well. And then in terms of scanners, um, well, in terms of workflow and scanning, um, Epson have a great series of um, scanners. The, the um, entry level models like the, the V550 and the V600 are really affordable. Um, and they do a really good job. They also do medium format, so that's kind of cool if you want to uh, push your boundaries in terms of camera. Um, I've got a few other models there. Um, also, you can just Google like, like five cheapest uh, film scanners, that'll get it done. Um, and then if you want to get labs to do it in Missoula, um, the dark room on Main Street will scan your next. Um, and then I've listed three others. Citizen Photo Lab is in Portland. Uh, they're really affordable. Uh, the Fine Lab is in Utah. And there's also the Indie Photo Lab. There's a bunch, but you can get labs to develop and scan your film. Um, and then I had some information there on printing for another section on uh, you know, analog printing and digital printing and workflow, but we didn't get time to talk about that. So I won't go into any, any detail on that. So yeah, film. There you go. Do you guys have any questions? Um, film that like I've had in the refrigerator for over a decade is just pop it in the camera and try. Is that okay? Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can definitely shoot expired film. Um, if the film has been kept in the refrigerator, you've got a much, much better chance that the film is still good. And there is a whole um, kind of subculture of people that love shooting expired films. So you can do some Googling about how they treat film. The big one is essentially what happens is as film gets older, it loses its sensitivity to light. And the way you compensate for that is to essentially overexpose it on purpose mm. um, because you know that it's not going to receive as much light. And the general, the general rule of thumb is that if it's color negative, you want to overexpose a stop for every 10 years. Okay. So if it's 10 years old, if it's 400, just rate it at 200 and then just meter normally. Um, if it's black and white, um, just under a stop, black and white sort of holds a little bit better because it's less complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, and then slide film, it's just a total uh, guessing game. So, yeah. Awesome. So for our online audience, I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up. Thank you so much for watching. Um, just a reminder, we uh, do put out videos all the time on our YouTube channel. And if you enjoyed this one, please like and subscribe. Thank you for watching.